All right. Well, this week, I'm continuing a series. I didn't actually know that I started a new series, but I did. Um, and so this is week three. <laughs> Isn't it nice to get a revelation three weeks into something? Um, but uh, we're, we're in a series that I'm entitling Our God. Okay? Our God. And we, we took the first week and we just talked about the God of all creation. We talked about how great our God is, how incomprehensible God is. I mean, for the most part, man has reduced God to something that we can understand and that we can comprehend. That's kind of saying the same thing, isn't it? But we've reduced God down to less than who he is, and he is more than anything that we could ever think or imagine. I mean, we've all tried to comprehend the nature of God. We've taught a lot on it here. Uh, but it's, it's just beyond our comprehension. He is an awesome, awesome God. There are four words. This is kind of like English class, all right? I got four spelling words. Uh, and they're not words that we use every day, but they're words that describe some of the basic attributes of God. And the first one is omnipresent. How many of you have used that word at least four or five times this week? <laughs> okay. And, uh, and that, that simply means God is everywhere, right? Then there's omniscient. We're going to be talking about that today, and that means what? God knows everything, right? And then God is also omnipotent, all right? And that means what? God is all-powerful. And then finally, and probably the most powerful of them all, is God is omnibenevolent. All right? What does that mean? That means God is always good. God's, God is always good. He's good all the time. The greatest expression of God is that God is love. So we're going to go into each one of these uh, over the next several weeks. All right? Um, two weeks ago, we talked about omnipresent, what it means to be omnipresent. And omnipresent really is talking about omnipresence, or it's talking about the manifest presence of God. It's one thing to know that God is everywhere, but it's something entirely different to say that God is here. Doesn't that change a little bit? I mean, we can talk about the omnipresence of God and say God is God is everywhere all the time. But for you to be able to say right now, God is here, is an acknowledgement of the omnipresence of God. And God want, wants us to live our life in such a way that we acknowledge his presence all of the time. All right? How many of you have been taking some vacations in the last couple of weeks? We talked about taking many vacations throughout the day, you know, in the uh, Jewish culture, people would stop three times during the day and they would be times of prayer. And I believe that it's necessary, and I think it's a good pattern, that you and I throughout the day take little one, two, three, four, five-minute vacations in the middle of your day to just stop and to acknowledge the presence of God. To take a moment just to worship God and to acknowledge how big, how awesome, how wonderful he is, that he's wisdom, that he's everything that you need. And if we can begin to develop a lifestyle where we acknowledge the presence of God in every conversation, everywhere that we go, how many of you think it would make a difference? Would you make any difference in any of the conversations that you have, any of the actions that you take, if you were aware that God was with you? I think all of us would on some level, don't you? And so, you know, the Bible says that I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Amen. He is with us all of the time. So today I want to talk about omniscience. <clears throat> and if you want to know how to spell it, because I misspelled it. I don't know, it turned up red in my notes so many times. I thought I need to get this down. But it's O M N I S. C-I-E-N-T, all right? I should probably put it on a board or something like that. How many of you remember 
omniscient. All right. There you go. It's not so much important to know the word as, as, as what we're going to talk about and what it represents. All right. So omniscience, God is omniscient. That means he is all-knowing. That means he knows everything all of the time, okay? He has universal knowledge, un- infinite knowledge. That's our God, all right? I want to read just a couple of scriptures real quickly. You probably won't be able to keep up with me because I want to bust through them. You can write down the references if you like. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, and how many of you know how high the heavens are above the earth? So are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And every thought that God has towards you is good. Man, they're very good. Romans 11 verse 34 says, For who has has known the mind of the Lord... Or become his counselor. I mean, God knows, knows everything. Psalms 147, 5. Great is our Lord, abundant in strength. His understanding is infinite. And I love this in Psalms 139, verse 4. This is, it says, Even before there was a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. Man, these are just verses that talk about the omniscience of God. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 30, talk about the omniscience of God. It says that even the very hairs on your head are numbered. Isn't that amazing? I mean, some of you has to spend a little bit more time counting than he does on others. But, I mean, God knows us that with that much detail. And not, a, not only does he know the number of hairs, and, and that's something to keep up with, too, you know, because it's not a constant number. It changes every time the wind blows. All right? But uh, Psalm 147, 7 says that he counts the numbers of the stars. Not only does he count the numbers of the stars, he gives names to all of them. Can you imagine that? We looked a couple weeks ago at a video that, that, that showed the universes at, what, 10 billion light years. I, I couldn't even begin to comprehend the number of stars, yet alone to give every one of them a name. And if I could give them a name, there's no way that I could remember them. As a matter of fact, my vocabulary doesn't have enough words to even get close to doing that. But this is talking about the omniscience of God. But one thing that I want you to see this morning is that when we think about all-knowing, usually we think about in terms of what we know, in terms of present knowledge. How many of you know something? (laughs) Every hand should be up here. All right, if your hand wasn't up, we'll pray for you at the end of the service. But God's omniscience isn't just confined to the present. God's omniscience is infinite and it is perfect knowledge of the past, the present, and the future. Isn't that hard to get the bubble of our brain around a little bit? God's omniscience isn't just about what's happening in the here and now and it's not just that he knows the history books better than everybody else. Man, he knows the future As a matter of fact, history really is the story of his. It's his story, all right? That's what history is. And from Genesis to maps in your Bible, we have a picture of the story of Almighty God, all right? So it says in Isaiah 46, verse 9, it says, Remember the former things... Long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning. See, God knows the end from the beginning. Isn't that good to know? Because in each and every one of our lives, no matter what we're going through right now, can I tell you that the ending is already written down in the book. And in the end, we win. In the end, he wins. In the end, he's coming again. For thousands of years from the day that 
that Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God prophesied that the day would come when of the seed of the woman would come and crush the heel of the serpent. God knew the end from the beginning. And it was thousands of years later that Jesus came. But can I tell you this, that when Jesus was raised from the dead, he said, I'm coming again. He says, I'm coming again. And just as surely as he came 2,000 years ago, he's coming again. And I believe that coming is nearer today than it ever was. I believe we don't know the day or the hour, but I'm telling you, I think we're in the season. God is omniscient. He knows the beginning from the end, all right? Have, uh, the book of Habakkuk, I know that's one that you all have memorized. It's a real small prophet, probably about two pages in your Bible, all right? He says, for the vision is yet for an appointed time, but it hastens towards the goal and it will not fail. Though it tarry, wait for it because it will not fail. There's one version in the Bible that says the things that God has ordained, the vision that he's placed on on your heart, will not tarry one moment beyond its appointed time. Aren't you glad that God has appointed times and seasons? Amen. And then Psalms 139 says, For your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all the days ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. Isn't that amazing? That kind of blows my mind. I'm not omniscient, so my, I can blow a circuit breaker pretty quick, you know. But every day that God has ordained for you has already been written in a book. And can I tell you who the best seller of all time is? If God writes a book, there are no books that have bad endings. He, he can spin some of the greatest drama <laughs> that you and I have ever imagined. But I'll tell you what, every story ends in glory. Amen. They were written down before and even a day experience or a day that we experience in our lives. Can you imagine what it would be like if you and I were omniscient? If we were all knowing and we knew everything past, present, and future? How many of you would like to play Jeopardy? I mean, you would know the answer to every question. I mean, you would, you would be the winner every day. I mean, you could get into any college, you would ace the SATs, you know, the MCATs and all of those to get into medical school and law school. Man, we, we could be dangerous if we knew all things, you think? How many of you think that would be good? <laughs> it probably wouldn't be good, you know. But uh, one thing that we need to know, and this is really, really important, because when I started thinking about the omniscience of God, I said, God, where do you want, there are so many different directions that you can go with this. And this is, this is what God put on my heart, and I believe it's important for you and I to know. That one thing that we need to keep in mind when we think about the omniscience of God is that God knows everything, and God never lies. Okay? God never lies. It, it makes a big difference to, if you had omniscience and you didn't always tell the truth, it's important for you and I to know that God is not only omniscience, but he, but he never tells a lie. Numbers uh, 23, verse 19, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. And the word repent doesn't mean to be sorry. The word repent means to change the way you think. That means God never changes the way that he thinks. He always thinks what's true. He always knows what's best. God never lies. How many of you believe that? You know, it's true. Um, Hebrews 6 verse 17, in the same way God desiring even more to show the heirs of the promise, his unchangeableness of his purpose interposed with an oath that by two things, Two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. We who have taken a refuge should have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope that is set before us. Man, it's good to know that our omniscient, all-knowing, omnipresent, always hear God, always tells us the truth. 
How many of you like to hear the truth? Amen. How many of you know sometimes the truth isn't always easy to hear? Sometimes the truth is, is difficult, but you know what? The people who have made the greatest impact in my life are individuals when I've gotten off base in a shadow or something like that, they have come and they have spoken the truth. Unless we hear the truth, we can't change, right? And so God's word is truth and it, it's, it's that canon, it's, it's that plumb line that tells us whether we're true or whether we're off. Tim, you probably know about that. I hadn't thought about this, but if you've got a line and you're looking for level, man, that, that line, what do you call that? A plumb line? Plum Bob. So the plum has a name. Bob. Wonder where they got that from. But uh, it's just like the stars. They all have a name. This plum has a name. His name is Bob. All right. But, you know, true is in relation to that line. Right? And so God's word is the, the plum line. It's the plum Bob. It's the plum Bible. All right. It tells us what's true when we're on or when we're off. Psalms 89 verse 34 says, My covenant I will not violate, nor will I alter the utterance of my lips. Man, God's, God's word is true. I know all of you know that, but we're talking about omni, omni, blah, blah, omniscience this morning, right? Maybe I should just say all-knowing. That's easier to say. A little tongue-tied. So, so let's say this. If God never lies then everything that God knows is absolutely true. Is that right? Okay. Then, and everything that God says is absolutely true. Correct? Therefore, if God is omniscient, you have to believe that the word of God is absolute truth. Okay? Does that make sense? All right, just trying to, this is really basic, it's, it's kind of elementary, but it's important for us to know that, that there is truth, that, that, and, and the Bible says that you'll know the truth, and the truth sets you free, all right? The truth sets us free, it's not what I believe that sets me free, it's God's truth, that's what sets me free, right? So, God's word is, is absolute truth. Jesus said in John 17, verse 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Okay? 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 28. Now, O Lord God, you are God and your words are truth. And you have promised this good thing to your servant. And then talking about the Bible being truth, it says in First or Second Timothy three sixteen, it says that all Scripture, the Word of God, is inspired by God and is profitable. All right, it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. God has given us His Word, His truth, in our Bible. That's why we say, "I believe the Word of God." I believe that I am who the Word says I am. I can do what the Word says I can do. Holy Spirit, open my ears today so I can hear what you're saying to me. What's he going to say? He's going to speak truth, right? He's going to speak truth into whatever situation that you're facing, decisions, places that you may need wisdom. See, the Bible that you hold in your hands is the absolute Word of our omniscient God from the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1, to the book of Revelation at the very end where Jesus comes again. Matthew 4, verse 4, when Jesus was tempted by the devil 40 days after he was filled with the Spirit, he said he was tempted to turn a rock into bread. How many of you know you're never tempted to do something that you don't have the ability? It's not a temptation. If, if the devil were to come to me and ask me to turn a rock into bread, it is not a trial. It is not a temptation. I can't do that. All right? But Jesus was tempted because it was within the realm of his possibility. And Jesus' response, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's true. That's where life comes from. When we believe the word of God. 
How many of you believe that it's true, that it's, it's our owner's manual? It tells us how to operate in life. Just like if you have a car or a truck, it probably came with a manufacturer's instruction manual, right? These days, I, we don't read them because it's got so much technology and stuff in it that it, it just doesn't make any sense. But back when I was a kid, man, you could, you could take an engine apart. You could actually see the whole thing under the hood and get your hands in there. But um, how many of you know that the manufacturer knows how your car is supposed to run? That if you don't follow the manufacturer's instruction manual, that you could get in trouble. If you decided that you wanted to put water in your gas tank because you couldn't afford gas, um, and that's what you wanted to do, and you believed that it would run on water, how many of you think that that would cause a problem? Even if you believe that it's true, okay? If you don't believe it's true, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm not saying what I want to say is try it, but then I'm going to get in trouble if some of you do that. <laughs> So I can't, I can't say that, all right? So the Bible is our manufacturer's instruction manual. It tells us, the creator of the universe tells us how we were designed to live and how life goes best when we follow the word of our omniscient, all-knowing God who knows the beginning from the end. Amen? How many of you believe that's true? We're looking for truth here this morning, right? Okay, so there's a problem. There is a problem. And we need to talk about the problem here for a moment this morning. Because there are many people that don't trust the truth anymore. There are, we're living in a culture and in a time where truth is being questioned. God's truth is being questioned. Truth in general is being questioned. I want you to look at this verse in Romans chapter 1. I want to, there's a whole lot here, and I could probably spend a whole Sunday, but I just want to cover one particular thought. Romans chapter 1, verse 21, it says that, that even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks but became futile in their speculation, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling things. Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity, so that they so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. Verse 25, For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forevermore. Man exchanged. We, we, God gave us a free will, and there came a point where we have the ability to exchange the truth of God for a lie. And you know, in my Bible, there's a little asterisk next to the word a, uh, because what it literally says is that we exchange the truth of God for the lie. Not just a lie, but we exchange the truth of God for the lie. And so I asked, you have to ask yourself, well, what is the lie that we've exchanged. And the lie that we've exchanged is the exact words that the serpent used when he spoke to Eve in the garden. And the lie is this, that you can be more like God if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In other words, the lie is that we believe that we know the truth more than God does. The lie is that for many people today that we've ascended in our own hearts and we sit in the place of God and we decide what's true and what's not true. 
We decide what the truth is. How many of you can relate to what I'm saying? You might not live that way, but you're aware that, that this, is, this is a mindset that exists in the world in which we live today, all right? So a lie is believing something that's not true, all right? It's deception, it's delusion, it's a, it's a falsehood, all right? So we live in a world today that is marked by relative truth. There is no absolute truth for many anymore. Does that mean that absolute truth does not exist? All right? If I've got a golf ball in my hand, and I tell you that I don't believe in gravity, I just don't believe in it anymore. Used to, but it's just not my truth. And I drop, I let go of that golf ball, what's going to happen? Why? Gravity. Because gravity is an indisputable truth, right? Whether you believe in it or not, it's true. And God's word is the same way, all right? Um, if I were to say, and this is crazy, all right, but uh, if I said that I believe that I am a 14-year-old black female with long, curly, blonde hair... <laughs> If I were to say, I believe that I am a 14-year-old black female girl with long, blonde, curly hair, and I believe that's true, that is my truth. That is my truth. Is it true? Is it true? How many of you know that there are people in the world today that would challenge that? That would challenge that, all right? Many people would argue that point today that I have a right to my truth and you don't have the right to infringe upon my truth. In fact, you must acknowledge my truth and you must accommodate my truth. Okay? How many of you are seeing that in the world today? See, we, we need a standard. We, we need to know the omniscience of God. It's not just so that we can say God is all-knowing. What God knows, because he never lies, it's the truth. So anytime that I, you know, if I'm looking at, I don't know how something works, I usually go to Google, all right? Because it has some truth. It has more truth than I know sometimes. But it, it, it tells me how to, to wire a light fixture without getting lit up myself, all right? Because I've done that way too many times. The Word of God keeps us in a safe place. But you know what? There's Man, I am not going to make it very far. We live in a generation where, you know, back in, in the early 1960s when the Supreme Court ruled against prayer in school and using the Bible, there is an entire generation that has been raised up and doesn't know the truth. The only truth they know is what they've been taught. You know what I'm saying? I don't know why my wife and I are going back. We're watching the old uh, Little House on the Prairie. Any of you remember that show? If you're younger, probably not. But man, I'll tell you, they go to school and they use the Bible as a textbook. They, they quote the scriptures in the, in the context of whatever's happening in life. This wasn't too long ago. But I watch, I've watched, I'm watching these reruns, and it doesn't look nothing like the world that we live in today. It, it's like, man, this is a whole nother planet. What happened? And in the name of technology, we have moved from the truth of the Bible to relative truth that, is, that says whatever you believe is your truth. I've got to accept it, honor it, and accommodate it. Something, at least to me, doesn't seem right about that picture. If my truth is that two plus two is five, that's my truth. What right does a teacher have to mark that wrong? Kids going back to school got to remember this. Relative truth. Okay. You can get 100 on every test because you believe that you've answered every question correctly, right? <laughs> if, absolute 
If, if everything was relative, there wouldn't be a standard to there wouldn't be a standard to grow by. See, the Word of God challenges us. It challenges us with truth. And the Bible says that God's Word is true. And in John chapter 8, it says you will know the truth. You're not just going to know it because you put your head on a Bible, you know, like Spock, and just do a kind of a mind meld type thing. Amen? We, the Bible says to study, to show yourself approved. The workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing or rightly interpreting, rightly understanding the word of truth. God is omniscient. It's important to know that. I haven't got time to go into this, but do you know that Satan is the God of all lies? He's the God of all lies. But God's word is always true. Romans 3, 4, 4, we've already said this. Let God be true and every man a liar. Man, if I have to choose between my own opinion, no matter how strongly I believe it, no matter what I've been taught, man, when I read the word of God and something challenges me in my life, I have a choice to make. I can either allow the word of God to change me or I can reject the Word of God and do thing. I'm reading a book where it talks about three types of people. There's a wise, there are, there are wise people, foolish people, and evil people. I mean, you know, that's true. A wise person is a person who, who hears the truth and they receive it and they adjust their lives to the truth. That's good, right? How many of you want to be wise? A foolish person is an individual who hears the truth and they bend the light so that they don't have to change. They hear the truth, but nothing's ever their fault. They always say, it's because of this, or it's because of that person, or it's because of, of this situation. But the truth never gets through to them. It's always out there. How many of you know, if that's the case, that's foolish. Truth sets us free. And then there's the evil person. And the evil person is the one who hears the truth and uses it against you. They don't want to hear it, they don't believe it, and they are going to attack you because of it. All three of these types of individuals exist. And I'm sure that you've met them. And maybe you've been all of them at one time or another. You know what I'm saying? But the Word of God, man, we've got to humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God that He can lift us up. Now, I want to end this morning by this. If God is true and he's omniscient, and he knows all things, then it's important to know some things that God says, all right? And Charles, I want you to go ahead and, and get that video ready, all right? But these are some things that you need to consider from the word of God, if his word is true, no matter what you're facing. And I'm going to go through this pretty quickly again, but in John chapter 5, it says, truly, truly, this is the truth, the absolute truth, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and, is not, and does not come into judgment but is passed out of death into life. We're born again by believing the word of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. It's the truth. We need to believe it, right? Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare. Plans for, not for calamity, but to give you a future and a hope. This is the word of God. James chapter 1, verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Man, I can't think of anybody better to ask. How about you? Let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. That's the truth. John 14, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. Isn't it good to know that you just don't have to store it away in your hard drive? But in the moment, the Holy Spirit will bring his word, the truth, back to your remembrance. So many times I think, where is that scripture? What's that scripture? I can't remember. Then in the moment, man, it comes up. Philippians 4, 19, for I can do all things, or no, 
Uh, th that's true also. But my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. That is the truth. All right. Psalms 91, 14 and 50. Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him with a long life. I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. That is the truth of Almighty God. And you know, one of the most important truths that you and I need to know is that God loves you, okay? More than anything else, we need to know it is the truth. It is not a lie. No matter how many people or how many times you say to yourself, how could God love me? God loves you. His ways are higher than your ways. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. He values you so much that he left the thrones of heaven to come and die on the cross because he wants relationship with you. He loves you. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world. You can make that personal. God so loved Ed. God so loved Richard. God so loved D. God so loved, insert your name, so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but has everlasting life. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrated his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God doesn't love you when you get born again. God loves you. He loves people even when they're in sin. We change because we get a revelation of God's love for us. We don't change because somebody comes up and says, you're going to go to hell if you don't believe the truth. No. People get a revelation of the character, the omni-benevolence, the almighty love, incomprehensible love of God, and that's what leads us to repentance, okay? We need to know and understand, not just intellectually, but in our hearts, the love of God that surpasses understanding. And so what I want to do as we close the service this morning is I've got a, a video that I want to show you, and it's called The Father's Love Letter, all right? This is a video. It is entirely the Word of God. Every word that you hear, you'll see a scripture reference underneath it. And this is, this is God's love letter to you. And I, I made uh, copies, and they're, they're sitting in the back on the table as you go out into the Welcome Center. And you can pick one up at the end of the service, if you like, on your way home. And read this. God is omniscient. He is all-knowing. He knows the past, the present, and the future. He doesn't ever tell a lie. And so as you watch this video, I want you to meditate on this being God's word to you. We've taken the word of God and we've condensed it down into a love letter for you. So I want you to listen to this. Take this to heart. This is God's truth about you. Okay? The words you are about to experience are true. They will change your life if you let them. For they come from the very heart of God. He loves you. And He is the Father you have been looking for all your life. This is His love letter to you. My child, you may not know me, but I know everything about you. I know when you sit down and when you rise up. I am familiar with all your ways. Even the very hairs on your head are numbered, for you were made in my image. In me you live and move and have your being. For you are my offspring. I knew you even before you were conceived. I chose you when I planned creation. You were not a mistake. 
for all your days are written in my book. I determined the exact time of your birth and where you would live. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I knit you together in your mother's womb and brought you forth on the day you were born. I have been misrepresented by those who don't know me. I am not distant and angry, but am the complete expression of love. And it is my desire to lavish my love on you, simply because you are my child and I am your father. I offer you more than your earthly father ever could, for I am the perfect father. Every good gift that you receive comes from my hand. For I am your provider and I meet all your needs. My plan for your future has always been filled with hope. Because I love you with an everlasting love. My thoughts toward you are countless as the sand on the seashore. And I rejoice over you with singing. I will never stop doing good to you. You are my treasured possession. I desire to establish you with all my heart and all my soul. And I want to show you great and marvelous things. If you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Delight in me and I will give you the desires of your heart. For it is I who gave you those desires. I am able to do more for you than you could possibly imagine for I am your greatest encourager. I am also the Father who comforts you in all your troubles. When you are brokenhearted, I am close to you. As a shepherd carries a lamb, I have carried you close to my heart. One day, I will wipe away every tear from your eyes, and I'll take away all the pain you have suffered on this earth. I am your Father, and I love you even as I love my son Jesus. For in Jesus my love for you is revealed. He is the exact representation of my being. He came to demonstrate that I am for you, not against you, and to tell you that I am not counting your sins. Jesus died so that you and I could be reconciled. His death was the ultimate expression of my love for you. I gave up everything I love that I might gain your love. If you receive the gift of my son Jesus, you receive me. And nothing will ever separate you from my love again. Come home and I'll throw the biggest party heaven has ever seen. I have always been father and will always be father. My question is, will you be my child? touches your heart the same way that it does mine. I've got a copy of that in my office framed. That is God's truth. That's what he believes about you. No matter what you've heard in the past, no matter what you've experienced, God's word is true. It's the truth. And God wants to have that kind of a relationship. Sometimes we have prayed a prayer and invited Jesus into our heart but we've never nurtured the relationship that that born-again experience was designed to bring about. And so God's invitation to each and every one of us this morning is draw closer. Draw closer. Because He's omnipresent. He's here. He's here right now. He's here with you as you leave today, as you celebrate uh, the Labor Day weekend, as you go back to school. It's there. He's with you. And he loves you. And every word that you just heard spoken over you is the truth.
truth. It's not a lie. No matter how many things on the inside of you that says it can't be, it's too good to be true. Well, that's what the gospel is. It's good news. So I want you to know that good news. And what we're about is helping each and every one of us develop a lifestyle that reflects the the deep personal relationship that God wants to develop, not just when we go to heaven, but right here, now, today, and every day. So that's, that's the invitation this morning.